you can't say i will just take rest and god will do everything for me god empowers me salvation is god's empowerment of man that's what salvation is so that you are now bigger than the devil you can handle the devil so that the devil will be defeated at your hand hi me now and your way cover me within your mighty hand when the ocean rises and thunders roar I will so One Timothy six, verse twelve to fourteen. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, to which you were also called, and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I urge you in the sight of God, who gives life to all things, and before Christ Jesus, who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ. appearing this passage is talking about fighting the good fight of faith now i i'm sure that as christians you know and if if you don't know already please know that if you're a believer if you're in christ and if you're living by faith it does not mean that you have a just a smooth sailing life without any challenges without any um without any obstacles to cross without any without any problems to face and so on actually as a christian you have an enemy the bible says you have an enemy and therefore there is a spiritual warfare of some kind that is involved and that is why paul talks about the fight of faith and he calls it the good fight of faith and uh, if you read any biography 
of any great man or woman of God, you will find that they have all fought this fight of faith to keep their faith and to stand in Christ and to endure through things and, and to achieve what they have been called to achieve and so on. So there is a fight of faith. So it's talking about fighting the good fight of faith. The word fight is used here, firstly. Secondly, another term is lay hold. Lay hold on eternal life, it says. First, he says, fight the good fight of faith. Secondly, he says, lay hold on eternal life. Now, that tells me why this fight is being fought. The reason the fight, this fight is there is because eternal life has been given to me. Eternal life is one term that contains within it all that redemption has brought for me in this life and in the life to come. Eternal life is not just dying and going to heaven. Eternal life is all that we have in Christ Jesus, the higher quality of life, this divine life that we have in and through redemption. So you have been given eternal life. You've been given every blessing, every good thing. Paul says to Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. It seems like there is something at stake here. God has given us eternal life, every good thing, through Jesus Christ. But we must lay hold upon it in such a way that we don't lose it. There is an enemy that is trying to take it away from us. There is an enemy that tries to cheat us out of it, out of the blessings of God. There is an enemy that tries to deprive us of all these things that have been given to us. That's the picture you get here when you read the words, lay hold. Lay hold of eternal life. That means... Uh, keep a tight grip on what God has given to you. Don't lose it. Don't let it get out of your hand. There is an enemy that is trying to take it away from you, the good things that God has given to you. Lay hold of it. Make sure you've got your hand on it and tight grip on it, he says. So fight and lay hold. Is, and there is another word, another phrase, and that is good confession. It comes in two places here in verse 12, as well as in verse 14, the good confession. These three phrases are related. The fight, laying hold, and good confession. Good confession is the way by which you lay hold. Because it's a spiritual thing. The fight itself is a spiritual fight. It is not something physical. So the confession, the good confession, I like the expression good confession. Paul uses it twice here, deliberately. Good confession, he says, as opposed to the negative confession or bad confession. This good confession is what some have termed it as positive confession, the good confession. What is the confession? He says, he says to Timothy, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold of eternal life. He's telling a young man, young preacher, he says, you got too much at stake. God has given you so much. God not only has saved you, has brought you into the ministry, has given you gifts, He's using you mightily. He's got a place for you to go to accomplish, great, to accomplish great things. He's got great plans for you, Timothy. So fight the good fight of faith. Run this race. Win. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold of all that God has given to you because you have made the good confession already, he says. The good confession is the confession that Timothy made when he accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. He made the confession that Jesus is his Lord, but then he's been making the confession of all that Christ means to him in, through, in and through his life and through his preaching. He has been confessing before people as a minister what Christ means to him and what all uh, God has done for him in and through Jesus Christ. So Paul says, you have already made a good confession, so walk in line with that confession. Do not change your confession. Walk in line with that confession. All right. So keep in mind the five areas of confession. And here it's talking about the good confession in relation to the fight of faith. So all of us have a fight of faith. We have to fight this faith fight in our life. Uh, God has called us for some reason. God has chosen us. Paul says, God has separated me even when I was in my mother's womb. I mean, if anybody has that sense of being separated in your mother's womb, 
for something very special. I'll tell you, that will cause you to live and excel and overcome all problems and keep going in spite against all odds. Paul had this sense within him that from my mother's womb, I've been separated for God's purposes. I'm very special to God. God has chosen me. Now, don't think just Paul is like that. Every one of you, if you are a child of God, God has saved you with something in mind. He has separated you from your mother's womb. Not everybody for the same thing, but everybody has a great purpose in and through Christ. And if that is so, then all of us are faced with this enemy also that is always in the business of spoiling God's purposes and God's plans in our lives. Wherever he sees God's plan, that's where the devil is. The great enemy of God, more than being our enemy, is God's enemy. He wants to spoil God's purposes. He sees God's purpose in you. He sees God in you. He sees God leading you and guiding you, taking you places, using you. And he is interested in you. He wants to ruin everything for you. That's the way the devil is. All right? So the fight of faith is something very real. You can't be some kind of a spiritual passivist. Some people say, well, I don't like to fight, brother. I'm not the fighting type. I am a more passive type. Well, if you're a passive type, if you're a pacifist, then, then you'll be history. <laughs> because you cannot achieve anything. You cannot go any place. You cannot win in this life. You cannot accomplish anything. You know, uh, you cannot be a pacifist as a Christian believer. You've got a spiritual fight to fight. You've got, you've got to fight. You know. that, that's, that's the way the Bible puts it. You know, for example, in, uh, in Ephesians chapter 6, if you read it, it says, in verse 10 onwards, if you read it, it says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Uh, put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able, able to stand against uh, the evil uh, one on the evil day. Eh? And so on. Uh, in another place, in James chapter 4, verse 7, Paul, uh, James says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Uh, all of these passages indicate that you are in a fight and you got to do something about it. One of the greatest misunderstandings, right now I'm dealing with it in, on Tuesday nights in our teachings, one of the greatest misunderstandings in this area of teaching is this, that you can't do anything, just turn it over to God, surrender to God. This, this idea of let go and let God, a very famous expression, you know. I used to believe it when I was young. I was told like that. Let go and let God. I could never forget a catchy phrase, you know. Who will forget it? They always told me, let go and let God. Because you can't. They use some verses, you know. It is not I that liveth, but Christ liveth in me and so on, you know. Uh, but in that very passage, you know, where they say, it is not I that liveth. And they say, look at, look at this. Paul is not living anymore. But at the same place, he says, nevertheless, I live. See? Somehow in those days, I never could catch what the Bible says. You know, I just simply looked at the preacher and believed everything he says. Never looked at the Bible, you know, and what it says. They said, just surrender to God. God will take care of it. You have nothing to do. You are nothing. Because you are nothing, what can you do? But now I read the Bible in a totally new way. Now I read it. It says, be strong in the Lord. For what? What am I going to do? I'm going to turn it over to God, surrender to God. Why should I be strong? That's the whole point. God says, no, 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 I'm not doing it. You do it. Any teaching that does not give man the kind of respect that man deserves as a man made in the image and likeness of God is not Christian teaching. That you must understand. That's one sure test to know whether a teaching is Christian or not. Christian teaching always gives man the... Uh, the respect that man deserves as one who is made in the image and likeness of God. When the Bible says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. In one place, the Bible actually says, be a man. It says. <laughs> That's Christian teaching. Because then it's treating you as you are supposed to be treated. Because you're not just a dummy. You're not of no value. You're not of no worth. You, it's not that you can't think, you can't decide, you can't do anything. 
and you are so powerless. Bible teaching presents man as powerful. Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and believes in his heart that whatever he says will come to pass, he will have whatever he says. This is the way the Bible teaching goes. So I'm convinced of that now. So that's why the Bible says, Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. God doesn't say, You sleep, my son, I will take care of the devil. God doesn't say, When the devil comes, please call this 24-hour line and we will help you with the devil. No. God doesn't say, You can't mess with the devil. The devil is too, bigger, too much bigger for you. So leave, it, leave the devil to me. If he had said that, I'd be very happy and I'd be happy to tell you that also. But he has not said that. He said, resist the devil and he will flee from you. God didn't say, I will resist him and he'll flee. You see how he'll flee from me? I'll show you how powerful. No, he doesn't say that. He says, you resist the devil and he will flee from you. So one of the greatest lessons I have learned in spiritual life is that God looks at me and respects me for what I am. I am made in the image and likeness of God. You are, you are made in the image and likeness of God. I always say, that's why I always say, believe in the God who believes in you. Respect this God who respects you. <laughs> this God respects you, my friend. He considers you as something. There's a lot of people that don't, that don't understand your value. Sometimes you yourself don't understand your value. Sometimes our own parents don't understand our value. God, through the Bible, see, the Bible is very healthy for our mental health also. See, you know, I didn't start out like this. After going to the Bible and looking at the Bible, oh, it has helped me greatly. It has given me good self-esteem to think about me in the way that I ought to think about me. You know, who I am, what I am, what kind of responsibility I have, what I can do, how I am made, what is possible for me. Nobody ever told me when I was raised in the church, you can't tell me I didn't go to church. I went to church every time church was open. I don't know about you, but I went to church. I had no option. I had to go to church every time. I was a preacher's kid, and we prayed morning and evening. We went to church. We read the Bible. We memorized everything. We did, I did everything. But nobody told me this kind of thing. So I value these things so much because later on in life, I discovered these things. And these things contributed to my mental health and my outlook and uh, my thinking about myself so much. It is so important how you think about yourself and what you think about yourself. If you go on wrong in your thinking, see, that is how the devil enslaves you. I'll show you that today. So you can't say, I will just take rest and God will do everything for me. God empowers me. Salvation is God's empowerment of man. That's what salvation is. So that you are now bigger than the devil. You can handle the devil. So that the devil will be defeated at your hand. God takes pleasure in that. In that you exercise your authority and you defeat the devil every time he comes to you. So like they say in the English saying, if you snooze, you lose, you know. You know the snooze button in the alarm, you know. It rings at 5 o'clock and some people hit the snooze button. They want 10 more minutes. They want, they're buying time, you know. They want to sleep 10 more minutes. And then 10 more minutes later, they're again pressing the snooze. And I know some people that all day press the snooze and stay in bed, you know. They're on snooze mode all the time. Spiritually, you cannot be snoozing because if you snooze, you lose. You got to be awake. The Bible says, awake to righteousness. Be sober. Be vigilant. Be strong in the Lord. Resist the devil. That's the way spiritual life ought to be lived. Amen? <laughs> so, this is, this is the biblical approach, you know. It doesn't make you a dummy. It makes you a very active, powerful, uh, empowered person. God looks at you in that way. Now, who are we fighting? Let's, I want to talk a little bit about who we are fighting, what this fight is about, and how do we fight this fight a little bit, you know, uh, so that you understand this confession aspect, you know. The words are the mighty weapons that God has given to you, the sword of the Spirit, as the Bible calls it. Uh, if you don't understand that, then you fail terribly because this is a weapon and it's right there. You know, it's like, you know, 
if you don't understand it, it's like you're having a gun and you don't even know how to use it. And, and it's for the purpose of protecting you, you know. Can you imagine a man having a gun and getting robbed for, you know, everything he's got, you know. And he goes to the police station and they say, what's there? They said, the gun. What do you have it for? I don't know. You know. It's just hanging there, you know. <laughs> I remember when I was a little boy, my uncle used to take me out, you know, everywhere. And, and my father's brother, he used to put a handkerchief right there on my shirt and pin it, you know. I didn't know what he was doing, you know, for a while, you know. Why? He'll always say, where's your handkerchief? And I'll just blink and he'll take a handkerchief and pin it. And for a while it just hung there. I never used it, you know. I didn't know what it was for. Then he showed me one day, this is for this, you know. I really needed it one day. And said, that's why we got it here. Use it, you know. <laughs> so a lot of people don't know what the word is there for, what the word of God is there for. The word of God is there. It should be in your mouth and in your heart. It's supposed to be your weapon again in this fight of faith to cause you to win. God has given to you this mighty weapon that will bring down the strongholds. So this is a great realization that you must come into. Then you will be serious about what comes out of your mouth. Clap our hands. Shame. He has overcome. 